All right, let's continue worshiping this morning. Stand as we sing.
this morning, we thank you that we in this place today can just lift our praise up to you, God, to know that you, God, provide that joy in our life. You provide that hope. God, you provide uh, what we need because of that relationship that we have in you, because of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, the one that we celebrate during the season that came as that child, that baby who would grow and become our Lord and Savior and our King and our Redeemer. So, Father, this morning as we've just lifted up songs of praise to you, Father, I pray that we've worshiped from our hearts today. And God, it's uh, truly a heartfelt time of just being in your presence. Holy Spirit, do a work today, we pray. We come in the expectation to see, Lord, what you want to do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. I'm going to try that again. Good morning. I'm going to be reading uh, Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Please wait. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jerethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but not yet consumed. Um, so Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and heard them cry out because of their oppressors. I know about their suffering, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land of the oppressors to a land of good, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So the, the Israelites cried out to help. Oh, so because the Israelites cried to help has come to me, and I have seen the ways the Egyptians are oppressing them, therefore go. I am sending you to the Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, or Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He answered, I will certainly be with you. And this is the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring all the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Uh, then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? What am I to tell you? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God, God also said to Moses, Say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for this time that we could come together and hear your word preached to us, God, and really just take in what you have for us to learn. pray that you open our eyes to what you want us to learn from Sage. I pray that you fill Sage's thoughts and mind with what you want him to say. I pray that you guide him through whatever he has planned to teach us. And I pray all these things in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evan. I don't know. I think this is yours. Good morning, church. You guys doing all right? Very good. Thank you. I heard a few okays. I hope it's okay. It's Christmas time. So yeah, we're going to be in Exodus 3, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and be there, because I'm going to be going all throughout it. Um, I do want to start by saying thank you. First off, Dylan, thank you for giving me this opportunity for uh, letting me come up here and preach from the pulpit. Uh, Bo, where is he? Right there. I have so much to thank you for. Bo's been pouring into me since I was 16 or 17 years old. He, is, he has truly displayed Christ to me in a major way, and I'm, 
I, not enough words can express how thankful I am to you. And church, thank you for considering me as your next youth pastor. Uh, I'm so excited. I'm happy to call this church my home, um, and I'm so grateful to be amongst such awesome people. So, so Exodus 3. Before we go into this pivotal story, I want to start by looking at some context because it's really important. We're jumping in kind of after a couple chapters of things that have happened in Exodus. So in the case that you're unaware of what's happening in the book of Exodus, um, we're going to look at what is happening and who we're talking about really quickly, and then I'll go into the text. So what's happening at this time? At the end of the book of Genesis, there's a guy named Joseph. He secured a safe home for the nation of Israel within Egypt because he was good friends with the Pharaoh. And uh, as time passed, Joseph and that Pharaoh also both passed. And there was a new Pharaoh that came about. And this new Pharaoh did not remember Joseph. He didn't remember the old Pharaoh. And he didn't remember anything uh, that they had done for God's people. In fact, the new Pharaoh did not like God's people. So uh, he enslaved them. He, he put them, he enslaved them and started making them build things. And, and they, they no longer had rights in, in Egypt. It, was, it got really bad. So that's kind of the time period we're in. Uh, who are we talking about? This is Moses. Uh, Moses was born in Israelites in Egypt. He was miraculously adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. He was raised in a royal house, likely with authority and much training because he was the grandkid of the Pharaoh. And at 40 years old, Moses grew tired of seeing the Israelites being oppressed because the Egyptian slave drivers were, drivers were rough on the Israelites. And so Moses tries to take a stand. He sees a Hebrew man getting beat by an Egyptian, and so Moses tries to take a stand. He decides to just act and not really think, and he kills this Egyptian. He thinks he gets away with it. Doesn't work out. Word spreads that the grandson of the Pharaoh killed an Egyptian, and so Moses' stand fails, and he doesn't stand again against Pharaoh. He actually, Pharaoh tries to kill him, and he runs off. He actually runs really far. He runs 300 miles away to Midian, and it's there that he settles down to live a very quiet life, completely different from what he was living. And uh, this is his new quiet life for 40 years until this passage that we're going into, Exodus 3. All of this leads to this passage. And as we look through this passage, what I'm focusing on through this, it's the name of the, the sermon, which is over there, is God's eternal attributes. The way that God is presenting himself to Moses is really important in this passage. Uh, it's very important to Moses and to the nation of Israel. And so as I was studying this, I, that's something that stuck out to me, that you can see God displaying his, his attributes to Moses. So we're going to focus on those and talk about them and what they mean for us and what they mean about God. So some of these attributes are, uh, I'm going to use some big words because I think you guys can handle big words. Some of these are, some of these are communicable communicable attributes, and some are incommunicable. So a communicable attribute is something that we, as God's people, can actually take on and we can display. His incommunicable attributes, we cannot display because we're not God. So I'm going to uh, point those out as we go through. Um, so starting with the first few verses, it says, uh, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. So the first thing that, I wanna, that we see here is that this wasn't just an angel that appeared. This was the angel of the Lord. I, I believe, and I even, Dylan and I had a conversation about this, and I'd, I feel very strongly, the angel of the Lord, especially in this passage, is referring to the pre-incarnate Christ. So we're celebrating Christmas, the incarnation of Jesus when he came down in the flesh. There are moments in the Old Testament, it's amazing, where you see Jesus appearing, his pre-incarnation, when he comes down and appears and speaks to God's people. Uh, it's amazing. This is one of those passages. So Jesus Christ himself, the creator of the universe, appeared and called Moses a lowly shepherd. And his means of doing so, which is so fascinating, he doesn't appear in a whirlwind like he does with Job, a scary, horrifying whirlwind. He doesn't even appear in a very strong tree that's on fire. Instead, it's this humble bush with a fire in it. This points to the first attribute of God, and that's his meekness, or you could also say his humility, the meekness of God. Our God is, he is meek. This simply means that he has immense power and might, but yet he withholds that power. He does not he does not display it all when he could. Um, so an example of this we see looking at Jesus' life. When Jesus was being crucified, did Jesus have the power 
to send legions of angels to take out these men that were attacking him. Absolutely he did. He had that power. But Jesus withheld his power in that moment. He was meek. And in fact, one of my favorite songs, there's a lyric in it. It says, like a lamb before his shears, he opened not his mouth. Like a lion, if he had, we would have all been devoured. And I think that that displays it so well that God had that power and yet his mouth, <laughs> he was silent. Because he was letting God's plan go forth. He was letting it go through. We often forget about how powerful our God is and yet how much he withholds that power. And uh, you've probably heard this if you've ever talked to someone. Some of you might have this thought, actually, where I've had this conversation with, with coworkers before where they say, oh, I, I can't step into a church. If I step into your church, I'm going to light on fire. I'm just burst into flames. <laughs> have you heard that? It's, it's crazy. Or they say, I'll get struck by lightning. Or they say, the whole church is going to fall in because of me. I think that that's so funny, but what's also interesting there is that they're missing the very point of the gospel that we base our lives, our church on. It is not that we're all good enough and you're not. That's not the gospel at all. You bursting into flames, you being struck by lightning or a building caving in on you, those are things that we deserve, but not just when we step into church. We deserve those things with every breath that we breathe. And yet, God in his patience and his humility and his meekness, he holds back that power from us. And then in his mercy, he pours his power out onto Jesus and not us. It's amazing. That's the gospel. So Moses sees God appear in this flaming bush. It's setting an example that's going to set up the rest of their relationship as well as the rest of God's relationship with Israel. And that's this truth. This is amazing that God in his humility and his meekness is willing to stoop down to Moses' level to work in and through him. God is willing to stoop down to man's level, to uh, a coward, to a rebel, to a murderer's level, so that he can work in and through him. The question that I thought of when I was writing this was, did God really need Moses to do this amazing work? Did he need Moses to deliver Israel from Egypt? No, he didn't. Instead, God chooses to take this rebellious, murderous coward who can't even speak well, who has no confidence in himself, to deliver Israel from the clutches of Egypt, from the Pharaoh. And this question goes further. Does God need us to accomplish his will? Does he like need? Is it contingent on us? No. God can speak through donkeys and rocks if need be. And yet, he chooses to work in and through rebellious, murderous, lustful, envious, prideful, foolish people like us. <laughs> what grace of God, what humility. And this is a meekness that we need, to, we need to imitate. This is a communicable attribute of God. You actually can be humble. You can be meek like our God is. Uh, and we actually see this, uh, Paul writes about this in the book of Philippians in chapter two, verses three through 11. I didn't give them this passage, I don't think but I'll just read this part real quickly. It's, it's awesome. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out for not only his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And then he gives an example of Jesus' humility. Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, so from king to servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, not just a, a servant, but a human servant. He's God. And when he came as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even lower. And then even death on a cross, the most humili humiliating death. And for this reason, we see Jesus humbled God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every name will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. That's the, the example of humility. If you think, well, God's not humble, why should I be humble? That's false and you've misunderstood who God is. God is so humble that he came down as a man. When He, he, he came down to live a, a dirty life with us on this messed up earth. So the humble Lord Jesus comes before Moses in this meek flaming bush and Moses approaches it and he's perplexed. He's like, this is weird. It's not, it's not being consumed. 
the bush is still there. The flame's just going. What's keeping this? Leads to our next set of verses four through six. We see God speaks out. God speaks out to Moses. He calls him by name twice, and then he gives him two warnings. He says, do not come closer, and then he says, take off your sandals. Both of these warnings are rooted in one danger to Moses, and that's the next attribute of God. The ground in which God's presence is on is holy ground because God himself is holy. To be holy simply means to be set apart, to be perfect. In our culture, we have things we consider holy. We have days we consider holy, set apart days, such as Christmas, even something like Labor Day, where these are just days we don't work. They're set aside. Uh, Some of us consider things holy even. Uh, There are people who will prize their vehicle, their their brand new truck or whatever, higher than anything else. It's a holy, to them it's holy. Uh, We all have different things we might consider holy to us. But God, his holiness is much different from that type of holiness. God's holiness is far greater, it's far sharper, it's far hotter than anything we could consider holy on this earth. God is so set apart from this world that he can't even stand the sight of sin. He can't be in the presence of it. He's so holy that when he does come to earth as Jesus Christ and he lives a life with us, he never sins. He doesn't give in to it. Instead, he is so holy that he continues moving forward and he does not give in to the same struggles that we do. It's not that that he wasn't tempted because he was. He was tempted a lot. And yet, his holiness, he's too holy. He's above all of this. In uh, 1 John 1, 5, it, it says that God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in him. There's absolutely no darkness. God is so holy, in fact, that when he appears before Moses, the very ground in which his presence is on is also now holy. And so much so that if Moses were to keep his sandals on and walk on that ground, it would be an offense against God. It would be disrespectful. It would have been wrong of Moses to do that. And so God's like, no, take your sandals off. This is holy ground. So what does God's holiness have to do with us? Well, it actually has everything to do with us. How will we react to the holiness of God? Well, we can look at Moses for both the reactions you see the right reaction, the wrong reaction to God's holiness. First, we see it in the passage we're looking at right now, where Moses' reaction to God, stating who he is, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> it says, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses had a right view of God's holiness in this moment. He saw God's presence. He heard God's words, and he hid his face, and he submitted to what God said. You know, if Moses took off his sandals because he's smart. I don't know how you could have stood there and not taken off your sandals when God (laughs) is talking to you and telling you to. But much later in Moses' life, we see the wrong reaction to God's holiness. After many years of leading Israel through the wilderness, once again, after several times, the Israelites complained about wanting water. So they complained to Moses, and Moses being the mediator there, he hears their complaints, then he goes and he talks to God, and he's like, God, they want water now. And so God says to Moses, this rock right here, I want you to speak to it. Speak to the rock, water will come out. And this is what it says in the book of Numbers, what happened. Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? And then Moses raised his hand with the, uh, with the staff and he struck the rock twice with his staff so that abundant water gushed out. And the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. So after so many years of leading the Israelites, of being in close communion with God, Moses and God were speaking. They had conversations. Moses would plead to God, and he would, he would come before uh, God on behalf of the people and saying, God, don't pull your wrath out on them. Like Moses and God had a very close relationship. And yet, Moses in this moment forgets about the holiness of God. He forgets about the holiness of God's words. He thinks, I don't have to do it exactly how God said I can do it my way and even demonstrate some of my power in this, my authority, my leadership. He says, must we bring the water out of this rock? 
it's imperative that we see that what Moses was doing here is he saw his words. Moses saw his own words as holy. He saw himself as, as the same spot as God and like equated to the Lord. And so that's why he was willing to disregard God's command and do what he wanted to do in this moment. And it obviously cost him. We have to be reminding ourselves of the holiness of God and holding to it daily. The biggest mistake you can make is believing that your word is as holy as God's word. Or for, for that matter, not just your word, but any man's word on this earth. People listen to influencers or people in the news or politicians and they believe their words to be holy and they're not holy. They're not God. They're not set in stone. We have to remember, we're not God. And you must be, we must be submitting to God's word daily because God and his word are holy. And we, this is the next thing, holiness of God is actually communicable. This is an attribute you can take on. First in position, when you come to know the Lord and he dwells within you, you become holy in the sight of God. It's beautiful. You're, you don't deserve that, but yet you are looked at by God and seen as a holy person because of Jesus' work. But still in practice, we have to practice holiness, okay? Sometimes we mess up at that. We still have to fight daily to practice the holiness in our thoughts, words, and actions. But nonetheless, we can display holiness and you can be holy. So next uh, section is uh, verses seven through nine. We see God says something very hopeful to Moses, something really amazing. He says, I have observed the misery of my people. I know about their sufferings. See, Israel, despite being called God's people, Israel had been enslaved to Egypt for hundreds of years. And you have to think that while Israel has been, while generations have died off during this time, some of them were beginning to think, maybe thought a lot, does God care about us? Is God aware of what's happening to us? I would think that maybe even Moses was, and perhaps that's why Moses wanted to act so much in that moment when he killed that Egyptian. Does God even care or, or know about our suffering? Well, here we see that God says he is not only aware of their suffering, but he has a plan to come down and rescue them. This displays the next attribute of God, and that is the sovereignty of God. This is an incommunicable attribute. You cannot be sovereign. We can't be God. We can't be in control of everything. And if you ever think that you are in control of everything, God will humble you quickly. <laughs> sovereign, I'll tell you a funny story with sovereign. Des and I, would, uh, we've been leading the four to seven year old class for the children, and in the last uh, book, the last lesson, at the beginning of it, we'd have to ask the same four questions every time, the repetition to kind of help the children understand what they're learning and, and reading. And the first question was, what word means that God is in control of everything? The word was sovereign. And we would tell the kids that, and then the next week, they'd be like, uh, and we'd say, it starts with an S. And I'll give Fletcher a lot of credit, because Fletcher would always get so close. Salvation! He'd always say salvation every time. And we're like, so close, Fletcher, so close. And we're like, just keep, you're like right there. And then he goes, uh, Jesus. And I'm like, okay, we lost him. <laughs> we, we lost you at that point. And then as soon as we went, sovereign, and then they would get it. They would get it after that. So sovereign, it, it means that God is in control of everything. Our God has not set life in motion and watched it spin out of control, not knowing what to do. Kind of like, I, I mean, if you... I'm trying to think of an example there. Th I think of a giant snowball. I, I don't know why. When they roll up a big snowball, if you push it down a hill, or you push anything down a hill. You ever seen someone push a skateboard down a hill? Yeah, you, that's out of control. Like you, Wherever that goes, it's going. You can't stop it unless you run down there, but it's too far. That's not how God created us. That's not how he created life. That's a false view of God and life. Instead, God created everything. And he gave man the choice to follow him or to not follow him. The, he gave man the choice to choose God or choose himself. And in the story of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve chose, chose themselves. In doing this, all of creation has been cursed. And all of the children of Adam and Eve, humans, us, bear that bend towards sin. We bear that sin nature now because of our uh, first father and mother, Adam and Eve. And because of this, there is immense suffering in the world. You don't even have to turn on the news to know. And there's suffering even amongst God's people. 
we have to remember, we have to look up in the midst of this world with tons of suffering and remember who our God is, that God is completely in control of all of it. This doesn't mean that he is causing these bad things to happen to his people in a maniacal way like an, like an evil uh, tyrant might. Instead, God allows bad things to happen for, uh, he allows bad things to happen to us to use for our good and for his glory. That's amazing, what, it's an amazing thing that God does. You see it all throughout scripture and you see it today that God is over and over taking disgusting, sad, horrible stories and he brings something beautiful. He brings life out of it. To bring it to Israel, God was not unaware of their suffering. He knew exactly what was happening to his people and how the Egyptians were oppressing them. But yet, God did not act until the right time. Now you might wonder, Sage, how can I know if it's the right time? How can I know if something happened at the right time? Well, you can know because that's when it happened. I know that seems kind of confusing. But for example, how can we know that God was coming to rescue Israel hundreds of years later into, uh, into their slavery? How can we know that this was the right time for God to come? Well, that's when it happened. So God knows more than we do. And we have to trust his timing because his timing is perfect. God is totally sovereign and he, this is so important. You can't forget about this part of it. God is totally sovereign and God is also totally good. So we can trust that with our sovereign and good God that everything will happen when it should, even if from our finite perspective, it, the timing seems poor. Now I want to emphasize that this is not a deistic sovereignty where people say this, they would say that I believe there's a God and that he is over the world but he's not in it. He's not involved, he doesn't really care about us. And I want to say that's not true at all, especially in this passage we see that not to be true. God is extremely involved in this world and his creation and his people. He said to Moses, I have come down, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God himself, the sovereign creator of the universe, chose to step into our world in order to rescue his people and not only just rescue them and throw them in the wilderness and like, look, you're not enslaved anymore, good luck. He continues to guide them to a, the promised land. And was, did God go through with this? Because he's right now he's just talking. Well, God sent, God sent many plagues to Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. God parted the Red Sea in order to completely deliver Israel from Egypt's clutches. God led uh, Israel through the wilderness, a cloud by day, a fire by night. God gave them the sacrificial system for temporary atonement of their sins. God gave them the law to shape them into a real nation. God brought them into the promised land and gave them victory over the people in that land. God was involved the entire time of the story. And he had a plan to rescue Israel. But they had to trust that God was going to follow through. To bring this to us, many people here, I'm sure, are suffering through a tough season. Or maybe a tough year. Or maybe a tough several years. And truthfully, if you aren't suffering now, there's likely suffering to come. It's a reality of life. And when we see our suffering and we focus heavily on it and our oppressions and our struggles, we tend to forget the sovereignty of, and goodness of God. We become self-obsessed and we only care that we are having a hard time and so we don't trust God. In fact, sometimes we could come to resent him. I want to encourage you do not resent God. Do not forget about his goodness. Do not forget about his sovereignty, no matter the situation. No one is more there for you than he is in every season. Just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not true. And in these seasons, we have to trust him more than ever. So remember the promises, God, uh, the promises of God and trust him to follow through with them. Trust him based off the, the, the truth of his word. Um. All right, so verses 10 through 12, God calls Moses to be the one to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. This is a very high calling for Moses that's very weighty because if you think about where Moses is at, Moses has a quiet life. He's a shepherd. He's got a wife, and he's working for his father-in-law. Things are good. He's not disturbed by anyone. It's great. God shows up and says, I want you to lead like millions of people through a wilderness and do a promised land. That is not an easy life. It is not a quiet life. Moses heard more complaining then than he ever would <laughs> It's probably an, a very dangerous 
very hectic and frustrating life. And so we see in verse 11, Moses shows a lack of confidence. This is actually gonna be very common. If you've ever read the book of Exodus, Moses over and over again, I think it's like six or seven times, he says to God, I can't do this. I can't, are you sure me? I can't talk well, over and over and over. He's always throwing excuses at God. And God, uh, no, the issue is that, the, the reason why it's a problem that, that Moses is putting or is losing that confidence is that he is placing all the pressure of things working out as they should on himself. He fears that because he can't talk well, because he doesn't think he's very great as a person, that God's plan can't go forth. But that's not true. We just talked about the sovereignty of God and how God is in control and will work all things for our good and his glory. And if that's true, can we really devastate God's plans? No, we can't. God's plan is going to go forth. And Moses thinks he can, but he can't. And it is in God's response to Moses' weakness where we see the fourth attribute of God in this passage, and that's the kindness of God. In response to Moses doubting himself, God does not say, whatever, Moses, never mind, I'll go find someone else. God doesn't just come down and say, I'll, I'll do this myself, Moses, go back to your being a shepherd. Instead, he reassures Moses. He says, I will certainly be with you. In God's kindness, we also see more humility and we see more patience. That God is willing to slow down for Moses so that Moses would feel confidence in God. Why should God the God of the universe have to stoop down to reassure a cowardly man. He shouldn't, but in God's kindness to his creation, he does. In fact, later when Moses doubts himself again, God does even more. Moses tells God that he can't speak well, and this is what happens in uh, Exodus 4 in the next chapter. The Lord said to him, who placed the mouth on humans? Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. And Moses, in his last-ditch effort to escape this, he says, Please, Lord, send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, Isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and also he is on his way now to meet you. He will rejoice when he sees you. You will speak with him and tell him what to say. I will help both of you, both you and him, to speak, and will teach you both what to do. And he will speak uh, to the people for you, and he will serve as a mouth for you, and you will serve as God to him. He's just saying that Moses will be del uh, relaying God's plan, God's words to, to Aaron. And then he says, take this staff in your hand, and you'll perform the signs with it. So we see God's sovereignty and his kindness intersecting in this right here. Because God had already sent Moses' brother. God knew that, that Moses was going to doubt himself. He knew he knew that Moses was going to say, no, I can't do this. I, I, I can't talk well. And Moses, or God's like, Aaron's already on the way. I've already sent him to you. How kind of God to do that. And also sovereign. Our Lord is kind to us, and we must imitate him. Obviously, God's kindness is communicable. We need to be kind in our demeanor. Not just, it's good to hold the door for someone. That is kind. But I'm talking about kindness that is you're choosing intent to be intentionally kind to the people around you in every moment, wherever you're at. You're always trying to be mindful of that, to try to be kind because it shows God's kindness. It shows God's love. It's choosing to, even the people who you think don't deserve it. Well, that guy's a jerk. I don't want to be kind to him. You should because maybe he needs that. Maybe he needs someone to show him kindness. And this goes to the, the, the last uh, attribute of God in the last few verses, 13 through 15. Moses asks God for his name. He's trying to, again, he's trying to feel a little bit more confident to go talk to the people, to the, to the Israelites. And so he says, who, who should I say that you are if they ask for your name? And God gives him actually two different names here. One he's used before, and this other one is, is uh, new to this passage. And both of these names point to another big word, the immutability of God. Immutable just means unchanging. The, how God does not change. The first name that he gives Moses is, I am who I am. And this seems confusing at first glance, but what God is doing is he is classifying who he is, his name, based on what he shows himself as. He he's saying, look at my attributes, this is who I am. 
And to explain further, God is pointing out, oh, I just said that, sorry. <laughs> the second name that he gives himself is the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now these names are tying together, and, and this will wrap it up right here. That first God says, I am who I am, and that is referring to the present. Look at me, hear me, hear my words, see what I'm doing, see my plan. Right now, this is who I am. But then he points to the past. He says, look at the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That is me, that is who I am. And then he says this in the very last verse uh, in 15, this is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Well, I am who I am can also mean I will be who I will be. Oh, I, I, I will be what I will be even. So to th- what's happening here is while we humanity are constantly changing, we're changing what we like, what we're interested in, the clothes we wear, we're, never, we're always up and down, we like something and then as a society we hate that thing later, we're always changing. God was who he was in the beginning as he brought an, about a nation through Abraham. The attributes that we see in God then are still true. God is who he is as he speaks to Moses and acts against Pharaoh. The attributes of God we see in him then are still true. And God will be who he will be. Remember, this is the angel of the Lord we're talking about. This is Jesus Christ. So this is an affirmation that when Jesus Christ would come to earth, thousands of years after this, he was the same as he was when he spoke to Moses in the burning bush. He was the same as he was when he, uh, when he spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He was the same as he was when he spoke the world into existence. Our God is not changing. A long time ago, before my family came to know the Lord, I remember a conversation with uh, my sister who is now a, a, the strong, one of the strongest believers I know. At the time, she didn't know the Lord, and I remember her saying, um, that she was trying to reconcile the things that the world, that we liked, that the world liked, and things that she sees in the Bible. And she said, maybe God's changed his mind. And she, now she would say, that's ridiculous. But that's kind of like the thought process. Maybe God's changed his mind. Maybe, maybe he's with us now as a society because we think we've progressed so far. We're so smart now, God. You, you should see that we're, you should be at our level. <laughs> it's totally off kilter. It's wrong. God is unchanging. He doesn't change throughout all of creation since the beginning of time to when Christ came to earth to right now today as he dwells within believers. God is the same. See, our God is eternal and unchanging and so are his attributes. He was always meek, holy, sovereign, and kind and he always will be meek, holy, sovereign, and kind. Another immutable aspect of God is seen in his desire and plan to rescue his people. While speaking to Moses, he sought to rescue his people, saying that he will come down to rescue them and guide them into the promised land. Well, look back to Adam and Eve in the garden. God, we see that he had a plan then to rescue his people. While he's speaking the curse to Adam and Eve after they messed up, he says, I will put hostility between you, Adam, and the woman, Eve. And then between your offspring, speaking to the serpent, and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is a a prophecy, the very first prophecy we see of God sending us a savior, someone to crush the serpent's head and rescue us. Already at the start, he had a plan. And when Christ came to earth, he said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And if you put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't, that salvation, that rescue is yours. Sin and death no longer have you bound to the punishment of hell, but you have life on earth and eternal life after. And one day, that plan is still setting forth. God is coming to rescue his people, and he's gonna take us home to the promised land. So, quick application, and that's all I got. Imitate God's communicable attributes, his meekness, his holiness, his kindness, We should be displaying those more than anyone else in society as God's church. You should be embodying these things and displaying it to the people around you at work and in school, wherever you are. And as for his incommunicable attributes, his sovereignty and his immutability, those are things that we need to meditate on. Constantly thinking about God's sovereignty so we can trust him in hard times and his unchangingness when culture is trying to change us. If you don't know about this God that I speak of, and uh, does the band come up now? I don't, is that right now? No, just kidding. <laughs> I 
All of these attributes that we've spoken about him are still true today. Uh, he is willing to come down to your level and save you because he is a humble God. He is able to make you holy because he is holy. He has a plan for your life because he is sovereign. He wants you to know him because he is kind and patient. And there's no point in waiting for another day to give him your life because God's unchanging. If you're waiting for something about him to change or someone to teach something else that you like better than the Bible, it's not gonna happen unless it's not from God. So come today and give him your life. Come today and declare him as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and be saved. I'm gonna pray. Lord, we're just so grateful for your word and your goodness. We're grateful for your humility and your holiness and your sovereignty, Lord. And I pray that as these words were spoken that you would uh, help us all to be meditating on those things that, that embody who you are, those attributes, Lord. I pray that we'd be remembering those things and reading your word to help us further understand those things constantly. And God, I pray that you would help us as, as your people to be displaying those attributes to others as well. Father, be with the church now, Lord, as we move forward and be glorified in our lives. It's in your name, amen. I can get the college students that I asked to help me First come up here.